Hello. Um, this is trying to work with Helga Lipma, who is currently associated with Cybernetica and Tallinn University. And I'm going to talk mostly about consistent computation. That is, uh, I'm first going to tell you what is the model of consistent computations, and then I'm going to give you two examples of consistent computations, namely consistent oblivious transfer and consistent uh, conditional disclosure of secrets. And after that, I will talk about uh, some theoretical results between those security notions. Um, okay? Uh, consistent computations is not as secure as full security in the malicious model. And as usual, the motivation for doing uh, less secure or relaxed security models is following. If you start from a semi-honest model, you get a really decent protocol runs very efficiently. Then you apply some certified computation techniques such as uh, a GMV compiler and you get a protocol which is uh, secure in a malicious model but it has high communication complexity and high computational complexity. Now if you use PCP theorem together with sublinear oblivious transfer, then you can reduce the communication complexity, but the resulting protocol has even higher uh, computational complexity. So for many practical protocols, it's infeasible. So the, the idea is that you should use somewhat intermediate security notions which provide you better efficiency guarantees. For instance, you can consider input private protocols where at the end of the protocol, immediately adversary is guaranteed not to learn anything about the inputs of honest parties. Of course, if uh, body can arbitrarily change the output of uh, honest parties, and if sometimes he can get to know the output of honest parties, then he might afterwards find out something about inputs as well. But uh, but what, what is consistent computation, it's an enhancement of input private protocols, and essentially what we do is that we put in a, a kind of fraud detection mechanism which assures that when honest party gets an answer, this is a correct answer. Um, okay, and how did we arrive there? to this point? We looked which properties we kind of can achieve easily and which can be sacrificed. Okay, it is relatively easy to achieve input privacy. There are two well-known transformations. First one is by Aiello, Ishai and Raygold, and it works essentially for whole crypto computing protocols which are based on Elgamal. Uh, okay, this Laura and Lipman's paper extends this for Payen crypto system. Now, if you want to have Consistent. Mainly, we want to add um, a, a kind of checking mechanism that honest party detect when its output is tampered. If you put universal check, which uh, outputs uh, kind of warns you if your output might have been potentially tampered, then you get into the standard security model, and this is inefficient. So what we do is that we consider a setting where um, where you get a warning that your answer is not correct, but this might depend on your input. Namely, adversary might be able to uh, cause selective protocol faults. But if you accept the answer, this is correct. And finally, what is nice about consistent computations is that you can issue fault complaints to third parties and show that indeed somebody acted maliciously. So how, how should we kind of formalize it? We do it using this ideal world versus real world paradigm. Okay, and if you consider standard uh, two-party security model, then it follows as usual. Both parties send their inputs to the trusted third party who computes the outputs, then sends one to the dominant party who can then decide whether protocol is aborted or proceeded, and if it's uh, proceeded, then the other part against the answer. Now, uh, we add only one small step to this model, which makes the trick. And this is the following, that after inputs have been submitted, uh, a malicious uh, party can uh, send a halting predicate to trusted third party, 
And if this predicate holds, then uh, trusted third party doesn't send the answers to the honest parties. Uh, but it continue, continues as follows, sends back the answer to the malicious party, and okay, this party can still decide whether to apport or proceed. And, of course, the predicates must be efficiently computable. And there is interesting thing. You can, you can see that the protocol failure is not directly observable by the adversary. Namely, if adversary when the, sits in the ideal world, he sees the same things when the protocol kind of ended with failure for the honest party and if it didn't. So the adversary can find out whether failure happened only if in the following post-processing context the honest party either complains or somehow it turns out that it didn't get the answer. Okay, and as you can see, complaint handling comes for free. Why is that? It's a trivial observation. If a protocol is consistent and correct, then if uh, all parties are semi-honest, then uh, uh, you always get an answer. But, so now if you sign all the protocol messages, and the honest party gets his replies and computes, and does, does, it, does it get an aborting uh, value at the end of the protocol, then it can go to uh, other parties, reveal its input, randomness, and all received messages, and then the third party can compute whether honest but indeed uh, followed the protocol. Of course, this is not good because usually you would like to hide the inputs. So what we do is that essentially if the protocol messages do not leak information about the inputs, then it's okay. Uh, but if they leak, we can encrypt the messages. So if uh, protocol messages are signed and encrypted, and then what the honest party can do, he can come up with a zero knowledge proof which says that, okay, he followed the protocol and obtained the failing output. And this is a valid complaint which says that uh, somebody acted maliciously during the protocol execution. And why is it better if you consider a client-server protocol? Then client usually does a little, very few computations. And for that client, it might be feasible to construct a zero-knowledge proof that he actually acted correctly and obtained the failing output. Whereas for the server, this is, might be practically infeasible. Um, so we are not the only one to propose such types of models. There are models for covert adversaries by Oman and Lindell, and there is a K-leakage model and it's important to note that this Omans and Windle model doesn't guarantee input privacy. Namely, with non-negligible probability, in the ideal world, uh, the adversary might get the inputs of a honest party. Uh, whereas k leakage model uh, gives you like up to k bits for the adversary. In our case, the le information leakage in the protocol is zero bits. But of course, in the post-processing context, the information can leak. Uh, now, what about complaint handling? If you look at uh, uh, ideal implementations of the covered model, then you see that complaint handling there is impossible. Um, it's possible for the K-leakage model, and it's also impossible for input private models. Okay, and let's see now a practical protocol. Uh, which kind of shows you that this notion is reasonable, it's, it's secure enough, and it actually achieves enough efficiency. So when we started to write this article, our motivation was that, okay, there are input private oblivious transfer protocols with optimal communication complexity, namely O log n, where n is the number of database elements. And the question, natural question is, can we extend this result to get kind of uh, security guarantees against malicious servers. Uh, and if we can, so, so how many rounds the protocol, new protocol would have, and can we achieve optimal communication complexity? And there was this, um, yet another motivation was that if we could do it in two rounds, then we could kind of get uh, reduced round count in PCP pr uh, proofs, but we didn't get it two rounds. But if you are more practically inclined, 
then the question is, can you build oblivious transfer protocol where you can detect that server cheats, uh, but still the protocol doesn't contain zero-knowledge proofs? So the construction, as you can see, is surprisingly simple. So let's see, what, what is there? Um, in order to, uh, okay, there, there is this sender and receiver, sorry, a receiver, uh, a client and server, and the server has a database, and uh, the server will just commit all database elements, send those to the client, and after that, you use oblivious transfer to fetch the decommitment values. Okay, and usually you would like to formalize we trusted setup phase where you generate the parameters for the commitment scheme and for the uh, oblivious transfer protocols. Now, if you want, as we, as we said, we wanted to have minimal communication. So in order to achieve that, we must use instead of ordinary commitments, list commitments, which are just as an ordinary commitments, but in the way that the commitment digest is compact. Uh, value which is sent to the client, client is small, and it must be possible to decommit individual elements, and the decommitment values must be small, and the commitment must remain binding and hiding, namely if you reveal one element, then the others must still uh, remain hidden. And what is good is it is straightforward to construct communication efficient list commitments using double layering, Essentially, you commit all the elements with standard commitment scheme and then hash the values together to get a um, shorter digest. But this bad news is that we don't achieve the uh, desired optimal communication complexity. Essentially, because we don't know how to construct a list commitment scheme with a communication complexity O log n. There is right now O log n squared, so we are log n factor away from the optimal value. Uh, okay. And now I would like to end of introduce some ideas how to prove security of this protocol. Uh, so if you look at a malicious sender, you see, who will commit uh, uh, all the database elements and then compute partial decommitment values. Uh, so if he acts maliciously, what should we do? You must construct a simulator, and the simulator gets a commitment value. Uh, and the simulator is supposed to give, um, okay, um, give um, um, the input to trusted third party. So what it has to do is it has to take a commitment value and extract what is the database. Um, if um, if we if we wouldn't wouldn't care about communication, we could use uh, extractable commitments, and then it would be trivial. The simulator would use extraction key and then extract all the commitments, but as the commitment is compressing, this is impossible. So there are several options how to do it. Um, okay, uh, first one is to do, okay, let's see the simulator, how it works. We do it straightforward way, we fix a randomness for the malicious server and the honest client, and then use this extraction to extract uh, committed inputs, submit this uh, extra trusted third party and construct halting predicates, and then fake the protocol execution and output whatever server outputs, and that's sufficient. Now, that there are two tricky parts, uh, extraction and halting predicates. Halting predicates is actually trivial because what we have is that we have a code for the malicious server and honest server, and we also have the randomness for the server and honest client. So, for any possible client input, we can compute whether the protocol in the real world would end it with abortion or not, and we just pack it into the predicate and send it to trusted third party. It's efficiently computable halting predicate. So, this is trivial. Non-trivial thing is the extraction. Uh, again, since we have fixed uh, randomness, naive way would try all possible queries, and for a single query it works, the slowdown is o -O ON in the simulation, but it's tolerable. But if you make like K queries in a row adaptively, then the slowdown becomes exponential. Now, what is also known, it's a very obscure result by me and Dr. Buldas, is that every commitment is actually 
binding commitment is extractable provided that the adversary doesn't have auxiliary input. So if we could consider setting where the adversary doesn't have auxiliary input, we can use white box extraction. However, if you want to use the protocol, then you usually use in a context where you have pre-processing and post-processing and you would like to have sequential composability. And for those uh, settings, uh, auxiliary inputs are kind of unavoidable, so this doesn't work. And what we are left with is that we use the whole hammer and use zero knowledge proof of knowledge where the server just proves that he knows what he committed. And of course, then we can extract what he committed and then proceed with simulation. And depending what kind of uh, zero knowledge proof we use, we get slowed down either one over epsilon or exponential in the number of rounds in the zero knowledge proof. Okay? Uh, now, what about uh, client? For the client, this is kind of simple, except only one fact that we have to submit something to the client uh, commitment before we actually know how to do open it, to which values to open. And therefore, what we have to use is just uh, equivocable commitments. And, uh, okay, this is the proof scheme, but what is important is what we do is that we use at the bottom layer equivocable commitments and then use any compressing commitment and, and then we get uh, equivocable commitment. And that is all we need for this construction. Um, the second thing I want to kind of discuss is this uh, conditional disclosure of secrets because it's a very nice protocol and it's usually used to convert um, input private, semi honest protocols to input private protocols. And how does it work? Is that you have a secret, a server has a secret, and he wants to release it, but only if the client's input satisfies some public predicate, mainly that the inputs are in valid range. And then you have several protocols for that where inputs are just encrypted, send it to the server, and then the server just sends a reply. Now, how could we make this um, um, kind of um, consistent? The idea is the same. We let server just commit uh, the secret and then use this ordinary CDS protocol to fetch the decommitment key. And again, if, the, if you don't manage to fetch the decommitment key, uh, valid decommitment key, the, pro the, honest, uh, the receiver just holds. And since we have only one commitment, we can use here theoretically extractable and equivocable commitments or use zero knowledge proof of knowledge. Uh, that uh, the server knows what it committed. So, to just summarize what I did uh, was that uh, th the most important thing of this talk is actually the model of consistent computation. It took us like one year to get it down in correct way, and I think we believe that this is the right way how to model uh, a setting where you want uh, correctness guarantees and input privacy, uh, but you don't af cannot afford zero knowledge proofs. Uh, it's very close to this uh, K leakage model, but it's it's a bit bit different. And of course, we have those uh, constructions for the oblivious transfer and CDS, which seem rather straightforward. Uh, but what is not so straightforward is the security proof. But but and. Uh, uh, necessary formalism, namely formalism of list commitments, so, and how you define that list commitment is equivocable, extractable, and so on. Uh, the big questions which we didn't solve in this article is that whether uh, two round consistent uh, protocols for two parties exist. And if they don't exist, uh, if they do exist, it would be very interesting, for instance, for oblivious transfer, because then it could make the PCP proof shorter. Another thing which is in the article is that, uh, notice the construction was rather trivial, that we committed the inputs and then used oblivious transfer or CDS to get the decommitment keys. And 
actually what can be proven is that uh, consistent computations and uh, commitments are closely related. Namely, if you give me a protocol for consistent computations, I can construct a specific commitment from it. So, commitment must be inside of those. But how they are actually related is kind of open question. And we didn't give you a generic construction for consistent computation, for instance, for two-party case. But this construction is actually in the article by Mohasol and Franklin, where they talk about K-leakage model, they have a protocol where you run two circle, yeah, circles in parallel. At the end of that, you do some verification check. And this actually could be a consistent protocol. However, nobody has ever analyzed and formally proved that this is a consistent protocol. And the one thing which is kind of also interesting is that the model right now allowed any kind of halting predicates, but you can specify a very specific halting predicate. For instance, like uh, uh, linear predicates or somehow equations or something which, and you could try to kind of limit it. Okay, and as I, as I see, I'm out of time, so uh, I will, I'm happy to finish right now. Let's thank the speaker. Do we have questions? Okay, I have a question. So about the setup assumptions that you use. So is the previous construction in the common reference string model or standard model? I mean, I, I saw those... Uh, okay, yeah. um, it's... Um, those parameters, yeah. if okay. you can explain. Yeah. Um, it's a proof theoretical trick. Essentially, you can always get rid of uh, this trusted setup by replacing with, uh, with a standard multi-party protocol. And for most uh, commitment schemes, setup is trivial. For the oblivious transfer protocol, usually you have to uh, generate a valid public, care, public key such that you know the corresponding secret key. So you can get rid of all that, but it's keep to prove simple and straightforward. Yeah, the, the point is that if you run a protocol to simulate it, then uh, there is a communication complexity that comes from that protocol also, right? So of course, have... yeah, but... So we have to carry on. Okay. Other questions? Okay, we can thank again, friends.